Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Ingemar Church. I am so glad that you have joined us for worship today. My name is David Streets, and I'm one of the pastors at Ingemar Church. If this is the first time that you are joining us for worship, we are delighted that you have tuned in. We do not believe that you are here by accident. Rather, we believe that you are an answer to our prayers. You see, we have been praying that you would join us for worship. We didn't pray for you by name, but God knows who you are. Please take a moment to complete a Connect card to let us know that you are here. You can do so by scrolling down to the link below the video feed or by going back to our website, engamarchurch.org. And now, as we prepare to begin worshiping God, hear these words from Psalm 95. Come. Let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. And now let us join Josh as we begin our time of worship together. Yes, church, won't you join us this morning for praise and worship with joy. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope Like wildfire in our very souls Holy Spirit, come invade us now We are your church We need your power in us We seek your kingdom first we hunger and we thirst refuse to waste our lives for your our joy and prize to see the captives hearts released the hurt the sick the poor at peace we lay down our lives for heaven's cause we are your church we Build your kingdom here. Build your kingdom here. Let the darkness feel. Show your mighty hand. Heal our streets and land. Set your church on fire. Win this nation back. Change the atmosphere. Build your kingdom. kingdom's power, reaching the near and far, no force of hell can stop, your beauty changing hearts, and you make, you make us for much more than this, awake the kingdom seed in us, fill us with the strength and love of Christ. the hope on earth. Build your kingdom here. Let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand. Heal our streets and land. Set your church on fire. Win this nation back. Change the
darkness fear show your mighty hand heal our streets and land set your church on fire in this nation that change the atmosphere build your kingdom near we pray Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. sun comes up, it's a new day dawn. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship Your the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul. I'll worship Your holy Oh, oh. 
it seems like there's a lot of uncertainty around us. There's so many people who need prayer, who need your help. Today, I pray for those whose health is compromised by this, this virus or who have other health issues. Pray for those who suffer from the economic impact of this virus and travel, manufacturing, hospitality, energy, and so many others. And I pray for healthcare workers and first responders and other public servants who put themselves in harm's way. Pray for our leaders of the world, our countries, our states, our cities, as they seek to help manage this challenge. God, it can be overwhelming. But you tell us over and over again not to be afraid. God, show us how to trust in you. Now in this this Easter season that's often so full of joy, it may be hard to find joy but help us to turn away from our concerns with self and to rest in the joy that only comes from knowing you, the author and perfecter of our faith. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Thank you so much, Josh, for bringing us into this moment of worship. And as you know, as a regular part of our worship together, we are invited into moments of gratitude. Psalm 46 reminds us that life is not always as we would hope and that sometimes trouble will come. The psalmist writes, however, that God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in times of trouble. The writer then goes on to remind us, be still and know that I am God and I will be exalted among the nations. Friends, when we give, we honor God. We honor God with our best, even in the midst of crisis. It's not about how much we give, but how it is that we offer our best with our heart. Today, in addition to our regular offering that we can give, we want to lift up to you an opportunity to give to the North Hills Community Outreach. North Hills Community Outreach serves the northern boroughs of Allegheny County, and one of its most significant ministries is a food bank. The poor and disadvantaged are often most affected by tragedies like the current pandemic. Our neighbors in the North Hills are not immune to this virus, nor the resulting economic impact that results. The demand for food assistance arising from these needs and the new existing clients of the North Hills Community Outreach are in deep need. Consequently, North Hills Community Outreach needs our help. 
today and throughout this week, we will have an opportunity to give both tangibly and monetarily. First, you may drop off non-perishable food items to entrance A of Ingemar Church's Christian Life Center. There will be a box marked for those donations. And secondly, you may give a financial gift to North Hills Community Outreach using our online giving platforms or by giving through the mail. Let us now offer our best in this prayer, acknowledging all that God continues to give in and through us. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious God, we thank you that you are always with us and that while the world seems to shift so rapidly around us, you are still God. You are our refuge and strength. Bless us in our giving this morning and multiply all that we have for your use. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Right now, as we practice social distancing and encourage safety, North Hills Community Outreach is providing food to families and individuals. This is an immediate need, one that we will continue to meet. We realize that providing emergency food to our clients is only the beginning. Our community is going to need more during this crisis. Our case management staff is fully prepared to assist those currently going without a paycheck with the issues the future will bring. Issues such as utility and emergency financial assistance, transportation, employment services, and household items they will need aside from food that our sharing projects can offer. NHCO provides these services to our community all year long, but understand that in the upcoming months, the need for these services will be much greater. Please help us help them, and together we will be people helping people. Our scripture lesson for today comes from Psalm 119. I will be re reading verses 105 through 112. Hear these words. Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. I have taken an oath and confirmed it, that I will follow your righteous laws. I have suffered much. Preserve my life, Lord, according to your word. Accept, Lord, the willing praise of my mouth and teach me your laws. Though I constantly take my life in my hands, I will not forget your law. The wicked have set a snare for me, but I have not strayed from your precepts. Your statutes are my heritage forever. They are the joy of my heart. My heart is set on keeping your decrees to the very end. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning, everyone. It is great to be with you once again. We are on the third week of our series of messages called Burning Questions. A few months ago, we invited people to submit questions that they wanted us to address in a message. And so Pastor Dennis, Pastor Greg, and I met to review the questions, to separate them into groups, and we selected the questions that we believed could best be answered in our message series. In the first week, Pastor Dennis offered an introduction and then answered the questions, why don't pastors know everything? And is Jesus the only way to achieve salvation? Last Sunday, Pastor Greg talked about heaven. How do we know there is a heaven? What is it like? How do we get there? And does it really exist? If you've missed any of our messages, you can find them on our website, ingemarchurch.org, which is how you got here today. So today, my topic is Scripture, the Bible. How do we know the Bible is true? How do we know it isn't myth or le legend? Who wrote the Bible? And what does the Bible say about a Christian marrying a non-Christian? All those questions I will attempt to answer. You know that the Bible is important to us at Ingemar Church. It is the basis for all of our messages. It's read each week in worship. It's important is emphasized in our first core value. We believe the Bible is the word of God and the source of our knowledge of God's love for us. It is the full and final authority on all matters of faith and practice. You also know that we offer various opportunities to study the Bible, 
to learn more about its content, to understand it better. This happens in small groups and in Bible studies. One of the best ways to understand the Bible is to take the Disciple Bible Study. Disciple is an excellent way to understand Scripture and to learn about the Bible. The class usually begins in the fall and meets for 32 weeks. Each year, we invite people who might have interest to take the class. It's a personal invitation extended to some, but it is an open invitation that is extended to everyone. Would you like to guess? Would you like to guess what is the number one reason? The number one reason people use as an excuse to not enroll in disciple Bible study. It's not that I don't have time, although some people do say that. It's not I don't like the teacher or I don't like groups. No one ever says that. It's not that night or day or time of night or day doesn't work for me, although sometimes someone will say that. The number one reason offered by people for not taking disciple, are you ready for this, is, but I don't know anything about the Bible. Hello? Are you kidding me? Isn't that the perfect reason to take disciple? So that you will learn about the Bible. You will have your questions answered. You will learn what you do not know. Listen carefully. There are literally hundreds of people at Ingemar Church who have taken the Disciple Bible Study. Their faith has deepened. Their lives have been blessed, even transformed. Some say it's one of the best decisions that they ever made. And others say it greatly enhanced their understanding of Scripture. You should take it. I did. And now to our questions. Question number one. Who wrote or collected the stories of the Bible? The Bible was written and compiled by all sorts of people. Some were prophets, and some were people who were working for prophets, writing down what they said and did. Some were active participants in the events taking place, like Moses. Most of the Psalms were written by David, some while he was a shepherd, and some while he was king. Three of the four Gospels were written by disciples, recording what they observed. Luke was a physician who traveled with Jesus and the disciples, and he wrote Luke and the Acts of the Apostles as a result of observing their actions and hearing of their experiences. The epistles are letters that were written to specific churches or groups of people, written by Paul, Peter, James, John, and others. Revelation was written by the disciple John while he was in exile. Many of the accounts about the various Old Testament kings were written by prophets who advised them, or scribes charged with the responsibility to create an historical record. The collection of books that make up the Bible is called the Canon, and it was compiled by groups of people, councils of church leaders, and others. Long conversations and great care and lots of prayer led them to determine what would be included in the Bible and what would be excluded. The Gospel of John was in. The Gospel of Thomas was not. Determining authenticity was a major factor in decision-making. For example, does the writing in this letter written by Paul compare favorably to the writing in this letter written by Paul. So, we know the names of many of the biblical authors. If you own a study Bible, each book in that Bible is preceded by introductory material that includes notes about context, authorship, date, and intended audience. A good study Bible is a good investment for all believers. But there is one additional participant that we must mention when we consider authorship and compilation of the Bible, and that is the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is that part of the Trinity that dwells in us in any 
believer. The Spirit comforts us. The Spirit encourages us. The Holy Spirit is that part of God and Jesus that leads us to realize that we need Jesus in our lives. The Spirit helps us to understand and nudges us to respond to Jesus, to believe and accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. The Holy Spirit also guides us in the choices that we make, in the decisions that we make, even in the things that we say and do. Well, for sure, you can resist the guidance of the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit will seek to guide you throughout your life. Paul addresses the value and the origin of Scripture in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. He writes, All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, for rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Peter also speaks to this tie between Scripture and the Holy Spirit. He writes, And we have the word of the prophets, made more certain, and you will do well to pay attention to it, as to a light shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy of Scripture never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So, Paul says that all Scripture is God-breathed, and Peter said that the prophets, though human, spoke from God as though they were being carried along by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, therefore I believe, and we as a church believe, that those who wrote down the words that comprise our Bible were led, were inspired by the Holy Spirit to write down the things that they wrote. And so, I believe... And we as a church believe that Scripture is the inspired Word of God. Now, some people will use such terms as inerrancy and infallibility to describe Scripture. I believe in biblical truth and the accuracy of Scripture. I do not believe that the Bible in its present form is perfect or without error entirely. I do believe that when the original authors wrote down what they wrote, that it was without error. But the Bible as we have it today is a copy of a copy of a copy, and on and on and on. It, is cop it was copied by hand. It is a translation from Hebrew and Greek into Latin, into French, into German, into English, into many other languages. And so the Bible may contain some inaccuracies and discrepancies and inconsistencies, but they are minor. They do not have a negative impact upon my faith or the value of Scripture to me. To sum up, the Bible was written by people, participants, leaders, prophets, and observers who are inspired by the Holy Spirit to record what they recorded. Question number two. Because much of the Bible was orally transmitted for generations mostly written after the fact by authors who cannot truly be verified, translated and embellished innumerable times and assembled by humans whose choice of canonical writings continues to be debated. How is it possible to insist on its truth, especially its infallibility? Well, first of all, oral transmission does not necessarily mean that something is untrue or inaccurate or beneficial to our faith. But in addition, much of Scripture was recorded by eyewitnesses. Some of the Scripture is made up of letters written by a disciple to a church and shared with other churches. 
The various parts of the Bible are essential parts of the faith of the people of God. They, those parts of Scripture, were important to them. They would have revered them, honored them, protected them, and preserved them. They weren't neglected. And I believe that the Holy Spirit was also active in guiding the preservation and the integrity of God's Word. In the years 1946 through 1954, the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in clay pots in caves in the Qumran community along the Dead Sea in Israel. Qumran was a one-time settlement of Essene Jews that was now no longer occupied. Inside these clay pots were copies of Old Testament books, all of the Old Testament books except for Esther, and they were written on parchment. The scrolls were hidden in pots in caves to protect them from attack and capture. 1950 years later, a shepherd boy who was caring for his sheep tried to frighten one of his sheep who had wandered into a cave. And so he threw stones into a cave to get him to run out. One of those stones hit a pot, a jar, and he noticed the sound and went in to investigate. And that was where he discovered these copies of the Old Testament scrolls. The original King James Version, published in 1611, did not have access to these documents. The newer translations, the Revised Standard Version, the New International Version, the New Revised Standard Version, and others have been able to use these Dead Sea Scrolls. Even the New King James Version was able to use them. There are some who would say that the original King James Version isn't as accurate as any of the newer translations and they would be accurate in saying that. But there are many of us who came to believe in Jesus through the King James Version of the Bible, as I did. The newer versions didn't come on the scene until 1958 and after. Here's my point. Even with the inclusion of the Dead Sea Scroll material, the newer versions were not so much different from the existing King James Version that all of a sudden all of the people who owned King James Bibles threw them in the trash. I do not believe that the Bible is infallible, that it is completely perfect and without any discrepancies at all in its current form. But I do believe that it is the inspired word of God, that it is the most reliable, most dependable guide to our faith and the practice of our faith. And I also believe that the same Holy Spirit who inspired its writing and compilation has also provided for the preservation of its message and the accuracy of the message that we receive as we read it. Question number three. How do we know that the Bible and the story of Jesus isn't myth or legend? Well, first of all, ancient historians dedicating to preserving history have verified the life of Jesus. Some of them were neither Christian nor Jew. One in particular was Josephus. Second, those who witnessed his ministry were eyewitnesses to his life his miracles, his crucifixion and resurrection, and they have testified to his existence and we have their testimony. Third, some of what we believe, we simply believe by faith. There is too much evidence to support Jesus' existence rather than to deny his life and ministry. On to our fourth question. What does the Bible say about marrying a non-Christian? Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, Do not be yoked with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? 
So Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, says to his readers, don't do it. Why? Because Paul did not want them to compromise or to corrupt their faith in Jesus Christ. Early Christians had to contend with pagans and Jews who did not believe in Jesus Christ at all, especially those who lived in larger cities and had to experience these people in marketplaces and in various other places where they might have interacted with them. Certainly in some cases, young men and young women fell in love with each other without necessarily spending a lot of time discussing what they believed about or whether, in fact, they believed in God or Jesus Christ. Do you remember the play Fiddler on the Roof? The theme of that, of that play was about a Jewish girl and a Russian soldier boy and the violation of their religious tradition. The same thing happens in our culture today. When a young man and a young woman meet and fall in love, most of them don't spend much time talking about their faith. Some do, most don't. They're crazy about each other. They're attracted to each other. They want to be with each other. They want to get to know each other. And so what happens? What happens if they are so in love that they decide to get married without resolving the issue that one believes in Jesus and the other doesn't believe in God or Jesus? Or that one is a strong believer and the other not so much at all? Now faith will become a major issue in their marriage. Or... What's even worse, it might become no issue at all. Hear me out. The first of the Ten Commandments says, You shall have no other gods before me. This is God speaking to his chosen people. In other words, God is to be the most important thing in your life. When asked what is the most important commandment, Jesus said, The first and greatest commandment is this, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your soul, and all of your mind, and all of your strength. You've also heard me say that the most important thing that can happen in a person's life next to being born is that they would accept Jesus and that they would have a relationship with him. Believing, actively practicing sincere Christians know that God is to be the first and foremost object of their love. Their love for God guides their lives. Their love for God leads them to practice his behaviors and obey his teachings and instruction. That love also leads them to worship God regularly. And so for that person to be united in marriage with someone who does not believe in God or Jesus, does not seek to follow or imitate the teachings of God and Jesus, can put them in a difficult situation. Now, you might be saying, yeah, but they can learn to respect each other's religion or lack thereof. And perhaps that's true. Maybe, maybe not. Suppose one worships every week and the other person in the relation never worships. And as life progresses, children arrive. How are they raised? Do they go to church or not? Does mother go and father not go? Or does father go and mother does not go? Do the children go? Proverbs 22.6 says, Train up a child in the way they should go, and when they are old, they will not depart from it. So let's suppose mother goes, take the kids, takes the kids while father stays at home. Eventually, questions arise. Why doesn't daddy go to church? And then they say, why do I have to go if my dad stays at home? Maybe one person in the relationship wants to make plans for Sunday mornings all the time, and the other insists on attending worship on a regular basis on Sunday mornings all the time. 
worship, church, and faith in God become an issue in their marriage. The couple argues, maybe they shout, and maybe one even mocks the other because of their faith. And then, and then something odd happens, something tragic. Not in all cases, but in some. In the interest of creating peace and harmony, they stop discussing their faith, and they never discuss it anymore, and they stop practicing their faith. And everyone gives up on their faith, and they drift away from God a little further and further and further as the weeks and months and years go by. So Paul warns us, if your faith in Jesus Christ is important to you, then you'd better not marry someone who has no faith or whose faith isn't important to them at all. And they don't believe as you believe, because if you do, your faith will become a major issue in your marriage. It will become a reason for significant disagreement or, or what's even worse, it will become unimportant to you both and it will cease to be an issue at all. And that, my friends, breaks my heart and it breaks the heart of God as well. Now, friends, I believe that Scripture is God's word to and for us. I fully embrace the content of our first core value at Ingemar Church. We believe that the Bible is the word of God and is the source of all knowledge of God's love for us. It is the full and final authority on all matters of faith and practice. You see, friends, Scripture... Scripture is the primary way we hear from God. Scripture is our guide as we pursue our relationship with God through Jesus Christ. It reminds us of who God is and all that God has done for us. It reveals how much God loves us and leads us to experience the best that God has in store for us. So now I'd like to invite you to follow these next steps in response to this message. First of all, would you please memorize Psalm 119, 105? You probably, many of you, have it memorized already. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. Another, another step is for you to get a study Bible if you wish to know more about the background of the Bible. I have an NIV study Bible. I have a Wesley study Bible. I have a life application study Bible. You don't need three, but it would be good if you had one. And any of those would be an outstanding choice. There are many others. I want to encourage you to join a small group that studies the Bible. And maybe if you're in a small group, you might encourage them to go back to studying just Scripture. Number three would be to take the disciple Bible study. If you haven't done it, it's, it would be very beneficial for you to do that. Number four would be for you to read your Bible every day. Go back to doing that if you once did it but have drifted from it. There are lots of Bible plans. If you, if you can uh, access the U version of the Bible, there are plans for reading Scripture. And number five, try to imagine your life, your relationship to Jesus. If you did not have access to God's Word, if you never heard what was contained therein, if no one ever spoke it to you, if you never had a chance to read it, because it is precious to us. It is our opportunity to hear from our Creator and our God. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you so much for this opportunity to study about your, your Word we do recognize that it is your inspired word given to us. And sometimes we take it for granted and sometimes we overlook or minimize the importance of what it says. But I pray that we would realize how important it is to our own personal faith development and that we would seek not just to know more about the Bible, although that's very important, but rather that we would seek to know the content of the Bible, what it says 
what you are saying to us. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Why don't you join me one final time in worship this morning? Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope with no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested and my life began Ash was redeemed, only beauty remained my orphan heart was given a name my morning grew quiet and my feet rose to dance when death was arrested and my life began oh your grace so free washes over me you have made me It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new, now life begins with you. Released from my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom you faithfully bore. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death was arrested and my life began, sing, Oh, your grace, oh, your grace, so free washes over me. You have made me new, now life begins with you. your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new, now life begins with you. Our Savior displayed on a criminal's cross. darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost but then jesus arose with our freedom in hand that's when death was arrested and my life began oh your grace oh your grace so free washes over me you have made me new now life begins with you it's your endless love pouring down on us you have made us new now life begins with you song of all the redeemed. Yes, we're free, free forever. Amen. When death was arrested and my life began. Oh, we're free, free forever. We're free. Come join the song of all the redeemed. Yes, we're free, free forever. Amen. When death was arrested and my life began When death was arrested and my life began When death was arrested and my life began
So may God, our great shepherd, guide you to green pastures beside still waters. May you want for nothing. May he restore your soul and lead you in paths of righteousness. And though you walk through the darkest valley, may you fear no evil and know that he is with you. May all conflict and fear flee at the sound of his voice, and may you dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Go in peace, and we'll see you next week. Thank you.